today we're all here to explore the question, how can art and design help us to renew our sense of well-being? In the context of memory loss and dementia, this question is essential. Its answer helps someone living with memory loss to retain their personhood and peace and to retain their connection with loved ones, their care partners, and their community. Now, overarching the discussion is inclusive design. Inclusive design reminds us that we can all benefit from nature's healing powers and to continue to feel connected even when we're confined to our own homes, which is, is very timely these days. Um, at the confluence of memory, art, and general lifelong wellness, we are thrilled to explore this question for our, with our esteemed panelists here today. Their expertise on human experience has brought to life a number of effective programs for those dealing with memory loss in ways that are truly beautiful and immensely impactful. It is my pleasure to introduce each of them here and to express our gratitude for their time, their passion, and for their insights. Um, Michelle Chang is the Director of Education and Community Partnerships at Fry Art Museum as of art, uh, art, August, I've art on the brain, no surprise, August 5th, 2019. Prior to joining the Fry, Michelle worked on an award-winning educational team at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum as a manager of integration level education programs. At Cooper Hewitt, Michelle's work to educate, inspire, and empower reached audiences nationwide, engaging everyone from teens to educators to lifelong learners in hands-on experiences that deepened their understanding of design and design thinking. Previously, Michelle served as Director of Education at the New Haven Museum, where she cultivated lasting relation, uh, partnerships and I'm sure relationships that allowed for innovative and dis interdisciplinary programming to grow while expanding the museum's presence and reach in the local community. Michelle holds a BA in Art History and Comparative Literature from Binghamton University and an MA in Art and Design Education from Rhode Island School of Design. Welcome, Michelle, and thank you so much for spending your Sunday morning with us here today. Thank you, Lana. Oh, pleasure, as always, is mine. Um, on to Margaret, another wonderful pleasure. Can you say that a lot? Hi, Margaret. Um, is an explorer of relationships. So Margaret Price is an explorer for the relationship between culture, humanity, and technology. She draws from marriage therapy, philosophy, biology, and psychology to deconstruct how to embrace and sustain what makes us human in a digital age. Margaret studies human nature and monitors the culture cultural landscape to identify areas for creative and strategic growth. Her passion for identifying latent human needs, framing opportunities and feeling of experimentation has taken her to speak to over 40 countries. It is no surprise that Margaret's career has placed her on the forefront of product innovation and organizational transformation. At Microsoft, Margaret's strategy and content is featured in the inclusive uh, toolkit which was awarded IXDA, nominated as a FASCO World Changing Idea, and was featured in the Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt Design Museum. As an expert in design curriculum and service design, the courses have been attended by over 50,000 people at Microsoft and are taught in universities around the world, with most recently being at NYU, MIT, and Brown. Margaret, it's always such a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time today, really. Always wonderful. And last but not least, Gene Genevieve Wanucha manages the communications efforts of the UW Memory and Brain Wellness Center, including editing the center's magazine. She also helped to develop a program that offers tours through gardens for, living, for people living with dementia, followed by nature art crafts. Exploring her interests in nature and health, she is now working with collaborators to create a therapeutic memory garden. As a botanical artist, she uses watercolor and pencils to reveal the beauty and motive powers of plants. And also a side note, I know this is an extremely personal project for Genevieve, so I'm sure we'll learn more about that today as well. So thank you, Genevieve, in advance for your sharing. And lovely to see you. Thank you. All right, well, again, I know we have lots of amazing things to hear about. Um, so I'd like to turn this over to our beautiful garden of experts 
to take us on today's path of discovery and exploration. Maybe um, we could start off, Michelle and Genevieve, maybe you could um, introduce us to the complex world of memory loss um, for a person and for their loved ones. Thank you, Lana, for your introductions. Um, I do want to start off and share that I think many of us know or have known someone living with dementia in our lives and uh, keeping in mind that dementia is a condition in which a person experiences a, a shift in their perception of the world due to changes in the brain. And the form of dementia that we're all most familiar with is Alzheimer's, um, but that is just one of many types and Alzheimer's seem, is, is, seems to be the most common one. Um, and that individuals living with dementia can have a spectrum of different abilities and capacities and experiences. So I think um, memory being the thing that we associate most with dementia, but other folks may have different um, experiences as well. Um, and I think what's interesting is um, at the Fry Art Museum, we like to focus on um, sort of the creative potential of that person living with dementia um, and catering to their different needs. And I think uh, as we go into the conversation later, we'll learn a little bit more about how we do that. Um, but it's really the focus on small group experiences and also looping in the care partner. Um, and I think for us, keeping that in mind, that it's not just the person who is living with dementia, it's the care partner who's helping to care for this person and what their experiences are like. Um, and this care partner maybe a family member, a loved one, um, or a care professional. Um, and we find that they are also often seeking respite or joy uh, as part of their experience too. Um, and certainly appreciate the focus on present moment awareness in our programming. And I do wanna also point out just to give some big picture framework. Um, so Jefferson County, which is a neighboring county here in Seattle is actually home to the largest percentage of adults over 65 in the state of Washington. So about 38% of their population. Um, King County where Seattle sits has about 13, 14% age 65 or older. So this is something that is touching a lot of lives here locally as well, as well for the Fry Art Museum. So I wanted to provide some of that big picture um, background as well. And I think Genevieve can share a little bit more in detail. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Um, as Michelle said, you know, I think it's great to define dementia as a shift in a person's experience of the world. But from my own personal experience, um, I think it's important to say losing my mother about a decade ago to frontotemporal dementia. I actually narrow that down a little and say that dementia is a shift in a person's experience of their social world. Um, my mother, Diane, was an artist and a gardener and an art teacher. And when her symptoms began to develop, you know, they developed in a very social context of a classroom. And I can imagine the impact that seeing the world through her eyes of feeling maybe confused reactions of students and other teachers as she perhaps forgot how to use the potter's wheel or couldn't come up with words quickly enough or dealt with some kind of troubling you know, um, changes in her social behavior. And looking back though, I see that the maybe most painful problem was that it was like a lack of opportunity then to engage in this meaning making process that's so important to our own, fulfilling our own identities. She was an artist, she was an art teacher. And maybe, you know, I think a key to human well being is to be able to have opportunities to have those identities. And looking back, I do remember how profound and important it was for me to observe, observe the fact she did paint a self-portrait. She did go on forest walks and, you know, she did actually during a day program suddenly spontaneously start to teach the other residents around the table an art craft. And I don't think I realized it 10 years ago, but as I think about it more and more, you know, framing dementia as a social problem really does give us then the possibility of solutions because we live in a social world. And if we understand and recognize that the person living inside never does actually go away, we can help them stay in that social world. That's so important. And I just want to bring really quickly up the findings of a study, I think that drive home an important point. Um, our researcher, 
at, at Seattle University, Nicole Shibliss in the Religious Studies Department. She did her doctoral research by bringing together a group of people recently diagnosed with Alzheimer's. So they were experiencing memory loss and she immersed them through VR goggle headsets into an underwater virtual reality environment into a coral reef. Beautiful, you know, fish swimming around, beautiful blue water. And then after she asked them immediately after she asked them to talk about their experience. And what she found was that they pulled on their own unique, you know, vocabulary of their spiritual experience. So people brought up God. They also brought up ideas of beauty and awe. People said things like, I feel like I'm part of a bigger, um, I feel at one with the world. I feel like I'm, I've come home, you know, and I think that's not surprising in terms of how any of us would experience a beautiful scene of nature. But it says something really profound in the context of memory loss that it shows you having an intact cognitive function, having perfect brain health is not necessary to experience these social self-aware emotions that make us realize that that person is still inside. So I look forward to telling you about a real contact, a uh, real practical solution involving a memory garden uh, a little bit later in the conversation. Hey, thanks um, both Michelle and uh, Genevieve. As you can, I'm sure as everybody here can see, there is so much to talk about and we haven't even thrown Margaret into the mix yet. So lots to get to. Um, Michelle, maybe, um, could you, uh, perhaps elaborate on uh, Fry's uh, creative aging program uh, as a case for looking to art for connection, remembrance, remembrance and more. Um, you have so many great things to offer. I know it at Fry. Great, thank you. Um, so the Fry's creative aging program started in 2010. So this is actually our 10th anniversary of offering these programs for this audience, which is very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, again, keeping in mind that it's not just for people living with dementia, but it's also for their care partners. And that has been integrated into a part of our programming from the very beginning. Um, and I have to give kudos to Mary Jean Connect, who I think is on today, uh, who is our manager of Creative Aging Programs, so helping to um, get this going at the Fry 10 years ago. Um, and a signature part of what we started with uh, was actually small group experiences. So it was called Here Now, or it still is called Here Now. And it started off as a pilot program. Um, and what you see on the screen is actually the conceptual model for this program. And uh, what we have here is um, sort of the framework that we're working with, right? So all these things that are existing called antecedents. So um, having whether or not our uh, program participants have previous art making experience, the degree of impairment based on their conditions. Um, and then this important part is the dyad relationship, which is basically, again, the person living with dementia and their care partner coming in to try to experience something either in the galleries through artwork discussions. Um, and the artwork discussions are very much conversation based um, and focused on what you see in front of you and not about recall. So it's not asking you, you know, can you guess who this artist might be or this artistic movement or whatever it might be? Um, and it's not about that historic art historical piece. It's really about looking at what you have in front of you and enjoying the conversation you might have with others in your group. Um, and from there, there's also the art making component, uh, which we do in our art studio. And because it's um, paired up with the person living with dementia and their care partner, um, it becomes a social experience, right, for the two of them, but also because everyone else in the class is experiencing something together, it becomes a sense of, or an opportunity to build community. Um, so they might talk about, oh, how might we adapt this tool to make it work better for uh, me and my partner here? Um, and our teaching artists, when crafting the activities, also keep that in mind. Are there limitations that we should think about? Um, can I adjust the materials or the process for them as well? Um, so it's definitely um, an interesting uh, experience. And that pilot, as you can see, um, through this experience, through engagement, facilitation, led to this really key part, which is, which is I think this joint respite and also this idea of personhood, which Genevieve touched on in her introduction so that it, um, despite any, you know, cognitive limitations, that is not what 
defines personhood, right? That's not what makes that person whole. Um, and so what we saw from that pilot was this, these really transformational opportunities, right? And also an opportunity for us as a museum to help destigmatize a lot of things around the dementia and the diseases in general. Um, and recognizing that this is something that our audience was dealing with quite a bit because our audience was also aging. Um, so recognizing that as well. Um, so from there, it really blossomed into all these different experiences. So bringing some of this art making into care communities. Um, so especially, or to personal uh, residences, especially people are more progressed in their dementia. So bringing it outside of the museum walls is really important. And um, also bring it into more rural areas where they may not have as much access. Um, and also large scale conferences. And I think some of the folks on um, in our participants today were actually part of our creative aging conference last week that we just came off of, uh, which was an annual convening of um, interdisciplinary speakers um, talking about creativity, dementia, healthy aging. Um, but what's really exciting is that it brings together people from all different backgrounds. So we've had everything from, you know, care partners to just lifelong learners or even chaplains joining in the conversation or um, palliative care professionals who are dealing with end of life, you know, situations with their patients. Um, so it's really quite a range and exciting to see um, different people who come together and are interested in learning more about the possibilities of arts engagement and uh, what it can do for people living with dementia and their care partners. So this is really, this conceptual model is really sort of the basis of a lot, a lot of our work. Um, and I do, I believe uh, if I could have the next slide, there are a couple images to show in the gallery. So it's a small group setting, um, as you can see. And here we're looking at, what's exciting is that this is a different kind of work. This is a costume here. So we're looking at all different kinds of work that allow for more um, of that experience. So, and what's exciting is that, you know, um, obviously we couldn't have been doing this in person since March. So we've been able to show works that in uh, digital conversations that maybe we couldn't see in person easily or were maybe in storage. So we've been able to bring in some more uh, than we even anticipated originally. Um, and I think the next slide shows um, how the art working, our, our, excuse me, art making looks in our art studio. So you can see how everyone's gathered. Um, and you can really see, especially even with the room set up, thinking about inclusive design, right? How it really can build up this sense of community and how it's um, really about that dynamic setting and space for everyone. Um, the next thing I wanna mention is that this all culminated um, in the next slide. Uh, first of a few slides here in our uh, exhibition actually that opened at the Fry in November but unfortunately had to close again because of some uh, statewide restrictions um, but uh, we did celebrate with a virtual opening reception um, but the exhibition really uh, showcases the framework with which we're using to um, craft these experiences and in particular um, this is sort of the beginning of the exhibition that you can walk through at the Fry Art Museum. And if I could have the next slide. Uh, so on this wall, we actually have three different pairs that we spotlighted. Um, so on the far left is one pair where it's um, actually Julia and Mary Beth Blackburn and they participated in the Here Now pilot and actually still continue to participate in programs this year up until the pandemic started. So they've been with us from the very beginning, which has been incredibly exciting to see how we were able to help throughout their process. Um, and then the second um, artwork is actually a watercolor painting in the center there. And you may notice it's a little hard to see, but uh, on the labels seem quite long for an exhibition. And that's because we try to integrate all of their different stories into the labels and the artwork. So here it's um, a husband speaking about their experiences and looking at art. Um, and that's the artwork reproduced in the label here. Um, and that looking at that artwork helped his wife really come to life in that conversation. It was something he hadn't seen in a long time. And the final uh, case, you see two little sculptures. Um, and that was done in response to, again, looking at a work of art that's reproduced in the label um, for this set. And they were looking at a painting that actually features monkeys in there, uh, which is a 
quite a familiar painting to many Fry members and uh, participants. Um, but uh, they created their own animals in response to looking at this painting and they decided to create animals that they find locally. So an orca and a loon. So it was really beautiful to see that they're internalizing this conversation and um, thinking about making it personal, right? And how it's really uh, connecting all those dots. Um, and the next image we'll see, uh, this is a really beautiful quote, which, uh, I think both Genevieve and I kind of paraphrased a little bit, but from Dr. Alan Power. So dementia is a shift in the way a person experiences the world around them. Um, and that was shared at one of our creative aging conferences some years back. Um, but this really, um, this quote and this moment we wanted to create in the space helps highlight a reflective moment. Um, so you see the bench there and there's actually a window next to it. So we wanted to build in some of these moments for reflection and for being mindful in this space as well in the exhibition. Um, and the artwork you see in this image is actually um, artwork that's done uh, in response to listening to music after looking at artwork in the galleries that was um, based on dance. So you can see that these are actually strokes and marks made in response to different rhythms of the music, which we felt was really incredibly powerful and a great way to um, integrate arts engagement uh, and focus on, our, on the present moment as well. Uh, next image, please. Here um, we have some more examples of looking at uh, artwork in the galleries and designing costumes uh, on the far left, the three in the far left. And the nine in the center are actually work done uh, as part of Bridges, which is the outreach program that we do where people work one-on-one -on -one with someone living in a care community. Um, and we decided to showcase different techniques here. Uh, so each artwork is done with a different technique, which we felt was a great way to showcase how um, the range of media you can use to engage people. Next slide, please. Um, and what's also exciting is, um, and Genevieve, I'm sure we'll touch on more, is the partnership with the UW Memory and Brain Wellness Center in creating what's called the Memory Hub. And on this wall, you'll see a, a, an early drawing of the garden, a memory garden for this space. And again, an, a different opportunity to be mindful using different kinds of engagement. So that's particularly exciting for us to see um, developing, especially in partnership with a, a longtime partner. Um, and then beneath that, you have three different um, activity cards that were designed as takeaways. Uh, and we're still working on making all of this content available digitally from the exhibition, but that will be coming soon. Um, and I'll be speaking in more depth later when we um, talk about practical applications and how to bring this back to your practices. Um, but these are uh, three activities that we have done in the past. Um, that we felt were good modes of arts engagement that you can do at home or bring to your different um, uh, locales and try it out and see how it might help with your audience or your partner, whatever it might be. Um, so we wanted to offer that experience as well. Okay. Um, and this is a great uh, um, sort of overview of the whole exhibition so you can see how it looks. Um, and, you know, I think Mary Jane and I are really grateful that we were able to um, reflect on the 10 years of doing this work and to give space to it physically in the museum too and to celebrate with all the virtual experiences that we've been able to do so far as well. Um, and we feel that this is an important step in continuing to bring this information to a more general audience. I think a lot of people, again, um, like I referenced in the beginning, are familiar with maybe Alzheimer's, but may not be familiar with the full range and the capacities and all the different ways to consider this audience as well. Um, and I think in the biggest part right now is our work in light of COVID-19 and some of the shifting we've had to do. Um, so a lot of our content has been made available on the Fry's blog. Um, and we chose certain experiences that we felt could be replicated digitally. Not everything obviously can be. It's a lot of it's very dependent on in-person sitting with the art or being together. Um, but we offer things like artwork discussions, art making videos, um, and also some sing-alongs, which is a, a remnant from our Alzheimer's cafes. So we're glad that we we're able to at least offer some of those experiences um, and hopefully more as we continue on 
in this process. Um, and then that's especially because people experiencing social isolation has really exacerbated a lot of symptoms that people are experiencing um, already because of aging. Um, and the pandemic we know has really heightened a lot of those. So we're definitely keeping that in mind as our next phase of programming. Thank you so much, Michelle. And so thankful and grateful that places like Fry exist and can hardly wait for the doors to reopen when we're all able to really be not only the virtual pivoting that you've beautifully done, but also in person. So thank you for sharing a glimpse into that. And we'll of course talk with you a little more later. Um, gonna shift now to Margaret, because um, as a leader in inclusive design, I would love to hear your thoughts on what I guess has been shared so far and also how it relates to inclusive design methodology. Absolutely, thanks. You know, hearing Michelle's incredible, the journey and all of the different multimodal interaction experiences at the Fry um, really hearken. And I know that Michelle and I, you know, and Genevieve, have, you know, talked about this uh, in the past and, you know, really thinking about uh, this concept of inclusive design, which is a methodology for embracing the full range of human diversity to create equitable experiences for the widest number of people. And ultimately what that means is we ask ourselves questions like who's excluded and how can we bring in excluded populations into a design process to ensure that we're not creating for people, but rather creating with people, which is such a beautiful part of the program that Michelle mentioned and what Genevieve will talk about in, in her work as well. And so there are really big, these big questions that we all can actually apply to our lives in thinking about how we might make assumptions about what people want and build solutions on those assumptions rather than carefully and thoughtfully bringing people into our process. And it's fascinating in this space you know, thinking about nature specifically, because many of us are told that nature is good for us, that we should spend more time in its company. But what's less flagged is really that nature is this important source of nourishment for our souls. And particularly now in a pandemic, this living metaphor for how to move through the darkest seasons of our heart, of our souls, of the, of the tragic, um, you know, things that are happening in the world around us. And so one of the you know, points about inclusive design that I love so much in Michelle's work beyond the bringing in of inclusive uh, diverse populations into the creation of these great solutions is you know, looking at the natural world and its cycles and its conflicts and its relationships and thinking about how all of those things can be brought into a space in an immersive way, which ultimately not only benefits um, those living with dementia, caregivers, family members, but all of us, because all of us are faced with asking ourselves really big questions right now, like, how can we get through? <laughs> how can we think about a connection with nature as a way that is an antidote sometimes to the difficulties that we're all living with on a day-to-day -day basis? And what does that look like? And what does that mean? And as we ask ourselves these really, really big philosophical questions, we find that nature, and particularly nature through an inclusive lens, can be a useful tool. And so one of the things I love, again, about, about uh, Michelle's work and Genevieve's work that she'll mention is that, you know, solutions that are often designed for somebody, um, what we might call an extreme user. So this might mean somebody, for example, with a permanent physical disability can benefit everybody in multiple ways. And so we think about, um, you know, repeatable processes and tools that can help us as product and as solution creators uh, do that so that many more people can experience the benefits of such incredible solutions. And we think about that, you know, with nature, you know, I mentioned we're all asking ourselves these really big questions. And I was reading the other day about how a bamboo forest is a symbol of resilience. And so I actually have a small picture of a bamboo forest right above my desk in my office as I work every day. And I think about resilience and what does that mean? And it sounds so simple, but sometimes these, you know, ludicrously simple acts can have very obvious uh, consequences and offer really surprising and yet meaningful philosophical rewards for our life and for the way that we experience life right now. Oh, absolutely. I could listen to you for hours, Margaret. Thank you so much. 
<laughs> um, so with that beautiful lead in, like another you know, way of thinking about this approach inclusively is to look outside to nature as has been mentioned already so far by both Michelle and Margaret, um, look to nature for solutions to restore well-being. So Genevieve, you know, maybe could you share with us your story of therapeutic memory gardens and how this nature-based approach can be an effective therapy? Yeah, absolutely. So if you're like me, I hope that this picture you're looking at make, uh, make you want to take a deep breath and get into the mind space of being outside. Um, so I want to start out by just addressing how the garden can be a context of, of healing. Um, you know, when I go out into a garden and I look at plants, and I do that a lot, I like to draw them. Um, and I think that this may happen to everybody too. You're not just looking at a plant. You are also able to see a reflection of human experience. So for example, you might go in and see a sunflower and that sunflower looks could look happy. You might see in it enthusiasm and um, pride. Uh, or you look after the rain at like a rose that's drooping down and you may say, oh, like that looks like that flower has just the world on its shoulders. And, you know, going through a period of anxiety or feeling alone, you may actually be able to, I feel like you're not alone in that experience. And I feel like in that way, plants and flowers, especially actually um, designed around us in a garden um, can almost hold our stories for us when we're in them. They can hold our emotions. So throughout a whole range that we may be feeling upon perhaps a diagnosis of a disease, when we feel uncertainty, when we feel like we're grieving, or when we have, like for example, this poppy really does, as Margaret says, just evoke a feeling of resilience um, growing out of the cracks. And so I feel like this, it's also happening, you know, in a very non-judgmental context, in a context where the beings around you are also going through a life cycle of birth and growth and death in a quite, uh, you know, beautiful, natural way. And it reminds us that we are a small part of a whole, a whole cycle, a whole system. So that's generally like how I look at it. And these ideas of a human connection to nature and the fact that gardens can be therapeutic is not a new idea. Um, it's been around through all of human humanity and it's um, very important in, for example, like indigenous wisdom. Um, and also you might know of the neurologist Oliver Sacks, who famously said that he has found no other therapy as effective for people living with severe or incurable neurological illnesses than music and gardens. Um, so I'd love now to tell you specifically about a really amazing project that we're involved with. Um, if you could go to the next picture. Um, in collaboration with the Fry Art Museum, the Memory Brain Wellness Center has the opportunity um, in the land outside of that hub building that Michelle was talking about to create a memory garden. And so I'm not coming from any expertise in landscape architectural architecture or design. And so I've been really learning from the members of my team. We have working with us two uh, horticultural therapists who are really trained in the use of plants and natural materials to um, meet specific treatment goals for people um, who are living with really serious illnesses or transitioning out of trauma or dealing with trauma. Um, so as you can see, this is like one of the very first kind of preliminary drawings that um, our um, Peach Jack, who uh, has experience in landscape architecture did after we had lots of conversations and about what we wanted to go into this garden. So as you can see, we have a very simple spiral structure, it's a wide path. Um, and I'd have to first note like what went into this it's interesting to think about it in terms of inclusive design. We went to the principles of universal design, which is a, a, cons, a set of guidelines in architecture and design that um, 
really make sure that um, a built structure is accessible for people with disabilities. And so, for example, the path will be wide enough, you know, for a wheelchair or two people walking by each other. There will be lots of sensory plant. So to be able to engage with the environment, for example, you know, I can't help but show, show you, you know, I mean, like plants, they have textures, they have um, sound qualities. There are plants that um, are extremely scented or um, edible. And so I think that though the important thing is so how why is this a memory garden as opposed to just a garden like why how is it built for and with people with dementia so as i learned from uh, working with our horticultural therapists who come from a very specific focus there's something special about an intentionally designed garden versus just being in nature or just being in a garden you know or just putting somebody into a garden and what that difference is is what happens there in the garden and so it's not a memory garden unless there are activities and programs kind of built in to the actual structure and plans for the garden um so the goals of action and effect are really built into this design actually the next um, photo. So that is Laura Rumpf, a horticultural therapist working with um, a person living with memory loss on one of the nature art crafts that I'll talk about the program of the Garden Discovery Walks later. Um, and that is just an example. And then we can go into the next photo. Um, examples of some kind of activities that we'll be able to do in the garden. Um, this was a really fun one where we're actually taking little bits off of scented geranium plants and putting them um, into their own pots and, and propagating plants. The man who's handling that plant, I remember him saying, um, is this possible? And then actually doing it and um, really being able to exercise his fine motor skills and doing it. Um, and these kind of crafts that can happen in a memory garden um, can really trigger all kinds of things like reminiscence. Um, and so also, and if we go to the next slide too, um, these are just some kind of examples. This is one visit we took to a garden on our garden discovery walks and the participants, uh, so that we set up a loom for them where it's actually a wooden structure with um, twine kind of, you know, in parallel lines. And so people were able to use plant materials, literally create something that um, was interactive and social and so meaningful for them to be engaging in the creation of activity. So that's just one of the examples of what can happen in a, in a memory garden. And to go to something that Margaret said, like it's not just a garden designed for somebody. Uh, we had one really key part of our process was holding a focus group where we asked a range of people who we thought might be involved in coming and using this garden, community members who were interested to tell us about what they really wanted and what they thought of our plans. And so we found some really great uh, advice. People said things like, you know, it, the land that, we that we're building it on, we're working with what we have. It is plopped right in the middle of a city, you know, in a medical district with, as it's next to the fry, you know, we hear, ambulances, it's bustling. What's cool about the property is it's a backyard and it's actually bounded by these little cypress, these kind of pointy cypress trees. So you feel like you're in a protected enclosure. It reminds me almost of a secret garden. And people had this great idea to put a water uh, feature in the back to create a kind of barrier for sound. Um, and we would not have really come up with ideas like that without talking with people. And um, some other ideas that people had, there were a diverse set of ideas. For example, some people really wanted the garden to be a place where they could be and sit and talk and make sure there were benches and make sure there were little tables. But other people said they actually did just want to garden and get their hands in the dirt. Um, 
And so I feel like we can, a garden is a place where we can um, prepare for all those possibilities. And, you know, this, uh, one of the most wonderful things someone said was that they wanted it to be like a way station between their experience in the clinic, which is right down the street, perhaps if they're waiting for a medical appointment, perhaps after a medical appointment when they're exhausted. We also want this to be a place where clinicians and um, social workers or whoever is involved in this experience of dementia to come and be. And it's, you know, it's a garden for everybody as well. Um, and I can see the activities and the benefits extending to to anybody, you know, um, but this is designed specifically with the intention of meeting the needs of, of putting the person at the center rather than just putting a person into a garden. Um, and it's also not just about, I think it's important to note, you know, we get so much from nature. And I don't mean to suggest that this is just us benefiting from nature. People um, were very interested in suggesting that we make sure we plant native plants, that we make sure that we're friendly to, we have bird feeders, you know, um, that we have pollinator plants. And so that's also something in addition to making sure that the plants we plant are sensory stimulating and perhaps uh, reminisce, um, provide opportunities for reminiscence. It's also about giving giving back and that certain reciprocity that's so important to our relationship with nature. I mean, gardens are places where we are called to take care of something and to make sure it grows. One other really, um, one other thing I make, think I, it makes, what makes it a memory garden is that we hope that people will help us build it and donate the actual plants involved. This, pro this garden is actually made possible by community philanthropic, very generous philanthropic donations. And we hope that people may be able to donate plants, donate things, pieces of art to go into the garden that they can literally donate in memory of a loved one or in, or in recognition of their own journey at the current moment with a diagnosis. That makes it possible to come back at certain time points and watch it change and watch it grow and have that be the representation of their disease journey or their um, ability or their um, kind of celebration of their own spouse or their parent. And so um, I think that is what I'd like to share and I think that maybe people will have questions later. So thank you so much for listening to my description about this really, really cool project. Oh, thank you, Genevieve. And I'm sure there are gonna be lots of questions. And speaking of questions, I'm gonna dive into a few of our own here. And then um, hopefully without running out of time, we'll also open it up to the audience. Um, and just as a little side note, if, if anybody does have any questions uh, for the wonderful people on the panel here today, please put them in the Q&A portion, um, that would be the easiest uh, for our facilitator to just um, quickly scan and pick out what we can. Uh, so starting off, a central element of inclusive design is that in designing with an individual disability in mind, you will automatically make an experience more accessible for those who may also have temporary or situational disabilities as well, which I know Margaret has spoken to wonderfully well, both I've heard her and I know also here today. Um, how can this method of care extend beyond those with memory loss to be beneficial for other things like, for example, mental health, stress release, um, you know, people could need concussion, anxiety, or, you know, any of these other many faceted things that we as human beings experience? Just opening it up, whoever would like to jump in. Um, well, I can just start in the uh, perspective of this memory garden. Um, you know, I often think in the context of conditions that impair, you know, our ability to 
move or get tired easily or be extremely sensory se sensitive to sensory stimulations, which can be a whole range of problems that we all may face at some point in our life. You know, going out into nature, like going out into a park or a hike, like, honestly, like might not be what someone really wants. You know, it might not be all that fun. Bugs, you know, it can be too cold, it can be too hot. And it, I mean, as as wonderful and as full of health benefits as going out onto a nature trip is, I think that an actual designed, intentionally designed garden can offer this space where there's not like pressure to move around quickly, you know, to keep up with a the group. There's uh, seats that are intentionally placed at certain parts of the garden. Um, to facilitate these experiences. So it both is a context that is relaxing. It can be a place of um, stillness and calm, but it also can be a place too of activity. It's not a place where you have to walk uphill. It's not, you know, if you get tired, you can rest. Um, I could go on and on about the benefits of, of a garden. And so that's generally um, my answer to that. Okay, thank you. Can I add to that? Absolutely, please, Margaret. I love how Genevieve mentioned, you know, calm, you know, few life skills are as neglected yet as important as the ability to remain calm. Uh, I think all of us potentially on this call, regardless of our background or where we are, uh, you know, the loss of calm has likely impacted all of us uh, and gone into agitation or anxiety or some of the other things that, you know, you had just mentioned. And so fortunately, this can be reversed uh, and challenged. And when we think about the role of nature to do so, life is overwhelming uh, and nature can also defy us. And so if we spend time in these vast spaces, they can help us to accept more graciously some of the things that happen in our life. Um, and when we think about the benefit of inclusive design in doing that, it's in that co-creation and that participatory design. I saw a question in the Q&A about, you know, what's the difference between universal design and inclusive design? And you know, to that effect, you know, universal design, the origin story is in the built environment uh, of architecture, where there can be often a one size, you know, approach. Inclusive design's origin story is in the digital domain, where we like to think about it as a one size fits one, because often there is no one size fits all approach. And so taking some of these benefits of inclusive design and thinking about being participatory and adaptive and flexible you know, recognizing that we need to support personhood and dignity and respect and recognizing that in particularly in relation to aging and dementia, you know, thinking about that personalization in the process, um, not as lack and as deficit, but through a lens of possibility and potential. Uh, you know, for example, you know, when we think about, um, you know, many nurses would say that, um, you know, a sense of wandering can be common. And we think about rather than trapping a sense of wonder, how do you explore a sense of wonder and creativity? And so what might it be like to ask questions and to more deeply empathize with the person rather than making any assumptions about sense of safety or self or personhood that we might think not having that same lived experience. And so to the question, I think, you know, there's so many benefits of this approach for all of us, um, yeah. Love that. Thank you, Margaret. Michelle, anything as well? Yeah, I do want to add. So one of the things I pointed out in the exhibition were those two sculptures of a loon and an orca, and those were made using Play-Doh. So it's very soft, malleable material. And um, a lot of participants in our programs when working with um, that material are reminded of different things uh, because it is so visceral. Um, and one thing I remember hearing about was someone remind got reminded of baking um, because it feels like working with dough. Um, so they, you know, they remember certain memories, right? In doing this art project that had nothing to do with baking, but the visceral nature of it brought it back to them. So I think that's a really interesting thing to think about is because especially in light of the pandemic, I think a lot of us have turned to the arts and baking and food as this mental release, right? From all the other things that we might have to deal with on a daily basis because of um, and to counter some of the social isolation for ourselves. Um, and so I think it speaks to that universality of creativity and wanting to, and I think food too is always this big 
way to bring people together. Um, and what we did with some of the programs, there's actually uh, an art making activity our teaching artists worked on that shows you how to create your own soft dough or clay so that you can do a similar activity at home. So it's about um, maybe you don't have access to Play-Doh right now, but you wanna try something similar to these activities. And I think one question in chat was, are there any more tangible things that we can try today if we wanted to? So I think we can talk more in detail about some of the resources, but I think those are some of the through lines that we're thinking about and hearing about someone's experience in the programs and how can we try to offer more resources to people who may not be aware of them yet, um, but also um, just as a way to try out and see if it works with your uh, loved one. Oh, that's great. I love that. And I need that recipe for the play. <laughs> so, and not play named, <laughs> so we can play in dough. Um, so, you know, due to COVID-19, we're all unfortunately still in the midst of, uh, the public's ability to access really all the usual programming has become that much more challenging. Uh, are there I mean, I think Michelle, you've touched on this, you just touched on this, you know, are there ways of practicing these lessons at home with loved ones or even, you know, just for ourselves? Um, are there resources offered? What resources are offered there by, by um, the three wonderful organizations at the table here today? Um, well, at the Memory Brain Wellness Center, um, we had been, you know, of course, offering this garden program for people living with dementia. So we would gather in a group in person and take tours around Seattle gardens and parks, and then afterwards engage in these art inspired activities that I showed a few pictures of. Um, and obviously that is something that had to stop in February or March. Um, we, one of the horticultural therapists that we work with had this amazing idea to actually just go virtual with it. And so she started filming um, her walks, um, mindful walks through these places that we had used, we brought people and actually um, we are, they're able to last longer and you're able to see more and you're able to follow along with her really relaxing voice. And then after she literally uh, guides people, the viewer through an art, a nature inspired art activity that they can do at home. So all of these videos, we've done it for six months now um, are on the YouTube site of the Memory and Brain Wellness Center. I think all of these uh, resources are linked in our introduction page to this event. Um, so we're, you know, working right now to understand are people engaging in this, you know, can, are people with memory loss or anyone, you know, does it engage people for a while? When do they turn it off? Um, what do they feel like is most important about this? But I feel like there are many now ways to look at virtual garden tours and virtual walks in general. That's something that I feel like is really exploding right now. Um, and then I think too, I've learned um, just even through the garden discovery walks that I um, helped helped build about three, four years ago. Um, you know, as Margaret was saying, some of these activities may, may seem so simple, like pounding petals into a little um, a little canvas bag and then filling it with Epsom salt and. Um, lavender or um, they're working with plants at your kitchen table. It's so simple yet I think for people who are living with memory loss or dementia or you know all of us can be so profound and bring such um, a natural sensory stimulating material. Um, so there are many um, activities I think that you could be inspired about from the garden discovery walk program that we that we offer. Um, that's one example from my own work that I can offer. Yeah. Thank you, Genevieve. Um, I also want to just build off that and just drop maybe in the chat um, a link to the Fry's blog and then the sculpture activity I mentioned. 
Um, so the blog has been really where we've been putting all of our digital resources since the pandemic started. Um, and there is a subcategory on there that's just creative aging content. So you can see some of the sing-alongs that we created, the art making opportunities and um, the artwork discussions. And um, while all of them, especially I think the artwork discussions are really focused on the present moment and just focused on what you have in front of you. While they were designed with this audience in mind, I think it's a great example of how it can really benefit others, right? It's not exclusively just for people living with dementia and their care partners. You know, a family could try out one of the art making activities. So I think it's a great example of um, things can, that can be tried out immediately um, and uh, using materials that we thought might be a little more accessible if someone doesn't regularly have access to art supplies, et cetera. Um, another thing that we're working on currently is actually capturing how we might adapt certain art materials um, to different needs. Um, so over the years in doing these programs, our teaching artists have come up with really you know, ingenious and creative ways to, if someone doesn't have quite the mobility in their hand, let's say to grip something, um, how do we adapt to that in the art making portion of the class. Um, so we're working on as a next part of our um, work here, how do we capture all that and share these tips with a wider audience so that what we've learned can also be shared. Um, and so I think that's an important way to um, showcase that, that there are ways to make things work and that just because someone may not have that mobility doesn't mean we, we don't do it at all, right? Um, that there's still an opportunity to approach that. Um, and I also want to hopefully bring up a PDF as screen share. So um, this PDF will actually showcase um, the three different art activities that we worked on for the takeaways from the exhibition. Um, so the first one um, will actually see, you see the expressive lines activity on the screen there on the left hand side. So this is that prompt uh, for creating artwork in response to music that we developed. Um, and so it's really actually, it can be a single person piece or it can be a collaborative piece. Originally in the studio, it was a collaborative piece. So one person, you know, made some marks on the paper in response to music and then it got shifted or turned to the next person and they were welcome to add on or elaborate on the existing marks. So it was meant to be this piece that kind of built and built, which I think is really a beautiful metaphor for the experience, right? And the sense of community that we're developing in the room. Um, and then the next set of activities, black and white, uh, is just what happens when you limit your palette to only two colors, right? What can you do in terms of composition and arrangement? Um, and so limiting your sort of like in design, you have limited, constraints, right? So what are you working with and how creative can you be with this um, set of constraints? And the final one um, actually includes, uh, this is the process for, for creating those animal sculptures that, uh, were, that are on view um, and also some tips for looking at artwork. Um, and I think that's a big thing about us as an art museum, how have we made these experiences unique to this being an art museum, right? And that's really that inter uh, interaction with and engagement with the artwork on view. Um, and so offering just a, you know, a beginning set of steps for engaging with the artwork. Um, and that's another thing that we're hoping to further as well in our next phase of programming. Thank you, Michelle. Margaret, now I know you've also been involved with creating so many different materials over the years. Um, what resources would you would you point to um, in your own experience and or creation that you would also like to share with with everybody here today? Yeah, so I know uh, in the best interest of time, I'll try and keep this as short as possible. Although certainly, I feel like I could talk about this for hours and hours. Uh, I saw that uh, that the Tea Leaves team posted the link to our inclusive design website, where we've got a ton of different resources. But frankly, there's been a ton of research from a number of experts all around the world in the space of inclusive design, uh, universal design, and dementia. And so a quick kind of Google search will also help yield a ton of great research studies and principles uh, from a number of leading experts, you know, all around the world, uh, beyond inclusive design, but specifically for um, the category that we're talking about today. Beautiful. Um, 
So I, uh, we're going to move on to some questions. We do have some time left over. So thank you all for doing such an amazing job um, to allow those in our audience to also ask some things that are pressing on their minds today. Uh, so the first I have is, uh, are you working with uh, landscape architecture? We have a brackets LA faculty at UW or LA is specializing in therapeutic design in the Seattle community to design what sounds like an incredible garden. So I'm sounding that sounds like Genevieve and or Michelle involved in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... We definitely um, really, uh, you know, once we build the garden, we're really interested in talking with others, um, especially, you know, at the UW and at the, um, the UBC Botanical Garden um, to learn about maybe what has worked for them. Um, but actually I should also say one of the key parts of designing our garden was visiting the Portland Memory Garden. So there, I think there are about, um, last time I checked, maybe 10 other memory gardens in the world. And the Portland Memory Garden um, is a kind of a famous one that we, we got to know the team there. And so our original plans were very much inspired by, um, you know, we got, we asked the landscape architect there and that's where we got the idea for the crushed gravel to put on the path. And that's, you know, it was very important for us to realize there should be focus points. Um, uh, maybe a tree in the middle, gathering places to sit around. Um, but I, and we are also in contact with, um, yeah, the uh, UW Architectural Department. They actually installed a healing garden at the Veterans Administration um, building that our uh, team, our garden team, went and visited for some of our research. Um, it, the therapeutic gardens weren't specifically for, for memory loss, they were for veterans and people kind of um, going through that experience, but seeing the choice of plants that they used and the structures they were able to build, it gave us a sense of what kind of, um, what project we were really, how big that this project, what kind of materials we had to use, what kind of funds are we really gonna to need to do this? Um, so, but we really are looking for conversations with other partners to understand how this can be an effective um, as effective as possible. Great, thank you. Um, so Margaret, I think we already touched on this, um, just back to you for a moment, or, or as long as moments or moments. Um, is inclusive design part of universal design? Now I know you touched on this, or a subset or other relationship. Maybe you can go into a little bit deeper into the differences. And I know you did give us a definition of both, but maybe um, specific examples or um, ways they're applied in our lives today. Sure. A great kind of universal design example that's often cited is the unobtrusive bit of public design called a curb cut, uh, originally created for wheelchair users to navigate from street to sidewalk to help that transition now benefits all of us if we're outside, uh, potentially if you're wearing heels or you're skateboarding or you have luggage. And so there are a series of incredible principles and guidelines for universal designers from the built environment for physical spaces, uh, the interior of buildings, the external of buildings, streets and cities and how cities are constructed um, that sometimes can't morph or change. Uh, but digital design, and this is the, I mentioned the origin of inclusive design, we have, you know, at Microsoft, we have the benefit, uh, the challenge, and the great responsibility of building adaptive and flexible systems that can stretch and morph to each individual person. And here you can think about the interaction that you have with, um, with your phone and all of the different apps on your phone and how those things should be catered to you specifically because they don't have to be one size fits all. And of course they can't be. And so there's this really great big challenge uh, in question that we ask, which is how do you create things for billions of people around the planet that are all unified in some ways, regardless of how different we all are, we all have very similar shared human motivations. For example, a sense of belonging, safety, comfort, connection. But at the same time, we all have idiosyncrasies. We all have things we like and don't like. We all have things that make us us. And so how do we create things for each individual? I mentioned sort of one size fits one, which is our mantra. 
uh, a little bit earlier because it's really about embracing all of the facets of human diversity uh, beyond binaries, things like demographics or age, for example, and really looking at multiple forms of how we interact in diverse ways to ensure that what you put out into the universe actually works well. And so in this space, there's a lot of that personalization and personalized adaptive learning that can happen at the beginning uh, and throughout a process as we think about how to approach um, interactions with folks uh, uh, who have dementia, but also teaching others. I, I saw a question in the chat about teaching kids, you know, how do you teach other people? Uh, and a lot of that is, again, not making assumptions, but, but doing that one size fits one individualized, personalized approach and thinking through different ways of scale. Absolutely. No, that's, I mean, that's one thing that I've, I've definitely felt here today with all three of you is, is just that sense of humanity that's really been injected. I mean, obviously we're talking about a very humanistic topic, but just, I think just the injection at every level of keeping in mind that we're not talking about this. I mean, it is a group in a sense, but within that group, there's such individuality and variety that we can't treat everyone in the same way and approach them as if it is exactly the same type of issues or problems or challenges because we all see the world in such a unique way. So, I mean, those overarching principles and the, the design philosophies and approaches at Fry and, and the amazing garden that's being developed and going to be and engaged and, and enjoyed and um, explored by all. Um, I know we're starting to run out of time here and I know there's still so many questions to go through. Um, so I think we're going to start sort of winding down a little bit. And I know some of you have to be on in other places and we so much appreciate you being here with us on this on a Sunday morning. Um, but you know, we're hoping, I guess, I think in general that the conversation today between beauty and uh, the beauty of nature, its potential for inclusion in your own wellness practices. Um, we've heard some great resources, which more than happy to reshare and, and drop. And I'm so glad so many of them are in the chat here today as well. Um, and anything that we can further provide um, after the closing of our conversation. Um, but we hope that, yeah, the creative methods of connection presented here today will benefit those in your personal circles or community or who are dealing with memory loss. Um, I mean, I know for myself, I'm taking away from each of you when I see my own mother today in um, long-term care who is, has Alzheimer's and, you know, thinking back to when my dad had it, I wish, you know, I knew all of you then and all the beautiful sharings um, that you shared with us today so I could share that with their world um, and include it in mine, but I'll definitely be taking it with me to my mom tonight. Um, and I'm gonna dig further into Fry and their 10 years of history in this, so progressive, amazing. I mean, Margaret, you're, and all the work you've done in, in um, so many areas and applying it and hearing it here today, thank you so much. And, Genevieve again, I can hardly wait till I can come down to Seattle and cross the border that is currently closed and putting that barrier between us, um, but bringing us together in, in this beautiful way as well um, is amazing. Um, just to remind all here, um, a selection of everything will be available afterwards um, event page and we'll more than likely share this is all about open learning. So Michelle, Margaret, Genevieve, on behalf of everyone here, I'd like to thank you again for your time leading us in learning that's taking place here today. Um, can't thank you enough. And as a final note, this will be the final session in our Nature and X Design of 2020. What an amazing way to finish. Thank you um, for making it so special here today. Um, hopefully in January, some of you will like to join us again where we're exploring with the United Nations Biodiversity, the World Biodiversity Forum, Botanic Gardens Conservation Inter International, and University of British Columbia Botanical Gardens, Microsoft, and so many more. So in the meantime, be well, be safe, and take care. And thank you again. Thank you.